Today I'm going to show you many things you can attempt if your PS2 Slim is having issues reading discs. The first half will be things to attempt from outside of the system, and the second half will be things to attempt after removing the top cover. The first thing you should try to do is clean the lens, blow it off, and then wipe it with a cotton swab dipped in isopropyl alcohol. Don't get hung up on the percentage that's labeled on the bottle. They all evaporate quickly, which is what we need to happen here. If it looks like it left a streak on the lens, clean it again. If that doesn't improve your situation, try playing with your game system upside down. It sounds odd, but it may solve your issue because it puts pressure on the door sensors. And it may also affect other mechanisms in the disk drive, causing them to work better. Alternatively, you can place your system in a vertical position with the controller ports at the bottom. This is an approved way to play because Sony had an official stand to set the PS2 this way. If you don't have a stand, perhaps you have some other things to it up with like some bricks or some books or something. I'll be talking a lot about those door sensors throughout this video because they create a lot of problems and there's a lot of tricks to get them working again. There are two of them and they are basically tiny buttons under the plastic. One of them is here and this little tooth on the upper lid presses down on the button when it's closed and that tells the system that the door is shut. The other is under this hinge right here. When the door is in the down position, that hinge pushes the button that's under there. If one or more of these buttons isn't getting pushed down enough, it won't play the disc because it thinks the tray is open. In some cases, you may be in the middle of a game and all of a sudden it thinks the door has come open. It'll cause the game to freeze. For other people, it causes the disc not to play at all at the startup. Both of those things were happening to me with this unit, but it wasn't consistent. Some days it would play just fine and other days I couldn't play at all. It is said that the door gets curved over time and that may be true for mine. If I press on it, it seems to have a lot of give, and that's so both in the front and the back. Then again, it may have already been like this fresh out of the box. I never looked at it this close before. The slim units are known to get hot, so maybe that temperature also affects the curvature of the lid. Either way, doing things to help push the tray down on both of these sensors may help resolve your issue. If repositioning the system didn't work, or you just don't wish to do it, the next thing to attempt is setting something on top of the tray. The idea is that it pushes the tray down and flattens out the that curvature so that it's more likely to push down on the sensor buttons. If you want to evenly distribute the weight, you can put something flat under the object, like a game case. Whatever you put there, I advise against having any part of it cover the other half of the system because that's where a lot of heat is generated and you may make it worse by covering it up with another layer of something. My favorite thing to put on top is a 2.5 pound weight. It's black so it kind of blends in. It's it's a little bit more aesthetically pleasing, and it's flat and heavy, so it distributes the weight all the way around. Also, since it's metal, it may help dissipate heat more than other objects you put there, even though the disc area doesn't get that hot. If nothing is working so far, there are yet even more things to do to get those sensors to work. Of course, the sensors may not actually be the issue, but these solutions are easy, so it's best to at least try them to eliminate it as a possible reason for your issue. This time open the tray and turn it upside down and gently tap the back of it. The idea here is that debris may get in and around the sensors and it may interfere with them functioning properly. And if so, tapping the back of it like this may knock that debris out of position. The next thing to try is to take a straw and blow down into the sensors. So blow into this hole here and then this hinge area here. If you don't have a straw, you can use canned air or an electric duster. You might as well blow out the entirety of the area beneath the lid to make sure there's no dust anywhere that can cause future issues. If blowing didn't work, try globbing some alcohol on a cotton swab and soaking the two sensor areas. And while it's still wet, close and open the tray multiple times. You can't really see the sensor that's under the hinge, but just soak around the openings there and it'll get down in there. You should also clean these grooves that are on the side of the disc tray. Because there's a lip on the upper part of the door that goes down into that groove, if that groove is full of debris, it's going to cause the lid 
not to shut down all the way. What I did is I soaked a paper towel with some alcohol and then pushed a butter knife into those grooves over top of the paper towel and just went back and forth. I didn't try it, but you could try increasing the size of this front tooth by adding a modest amount of tape or something to it, maybe some glue. This may help it push better on that front sensor button. There is one last thing to attempt before going inside. Gently clean this area beneath the lens with a cotton swab and alcohol. Some people have reported this helps, but there doesn't seem to be anything in that area that benefits from cleaning. I suspect that the nudge that it takes to clean it may shift the mechanism so that it starts working again. We don't know, but it only takes a minute to do it, so you might as well try it. If nothing has worked so far, it's time to do things from the inside. Unplug everything and flip the system over. Ignore these large rubber pads that I have on mine. I added those myself to raise the profile of the system. There are six screws on the back that need removed. The three on this side are under little plastic doors that you can pry up easily with a tiny flathead screwdriver. One of these doors is also under the warranty sticker, if yours still has the sticker on there. The last two are under these rubber feet, which can also be pried up with a screwdriver. Then take the screws out. I'm using a size one Phillips screwdriver. Flip the system back around and pry off the top piece. I had to do the prying from many different angles before the whole thing came off. Here's one of the door sensors and what it looks like up close. This is the one that was underneath the hinge. I'm pushing it to show you how it works, but I advise against pushing it in that way. It can break very easily if you apply too much pressure to it. And here's the other sensor, which is part of the power button board. Blow into both of the sensors and douse them with alcohol. And while you're at it, go ahead and blow out the entire interior of the system. There's also a spring mechanism that holds the door shut. If that area looks dirty, clean it. It's probably not the cause of the issue, but we want to make sure we cover all the bases here. For now, we will continue to assume these sensors are the issue. Try taping both of the tiny buttons on them down. That way the PS2 will think that the door is always shut and maybe that'll help you with your issue. Another trick can be done with the one that's on the power button board here. You can slide the board out and put some tape on the bottom of it so that the board sits higher than it was to begin with. This makes it more likely that the tooth on the top of the door will be able to press the button fully. You can also replace the entire power button board. As for the other sensor, it's a bit tougher to replace. I haven't seen them for sale by themselves. It's soldered to the board, and what some people do is desolder it and remove it, which leaves behind four solder pads. They then connect the two top pads with a small wire. That basically mimics the button being pressed down. And also, since you have the lid off, you have access to the tooth that's underneath the hinge. And just like the other tooth, you can increase the size of it with some tape or something. Although I don't think that tape will last, you can see how much wear is on the tooth from hitting that button there. But this is another option if you need it. That's pretty much all you can do with the sensors. Let's turn our attention to the drive itself. If you look at mine, there's a lot of gunk on this gear right here, and it has collected dirt and some hair. It's a lubricant, and it seems to have dried out a bit. If yours looks similar, that mess could be interfering with the lens's ability to move up and down and scan the disc. By removing the old lubricant and applying some new back onto everything, that should make everything work better. First, remove the gunk that's already on there. Removing it all from this gear is tricky because of all the grooves. I used a lot of Q-tips and alcohol and a toothbrush and at some times I used a paper towel soaked in alcohol. There's also lubricant on this side rail here, so I'm going to remove that as well. You gotta get underneath that rail, and pretty much the only way I could do it is to smush a cotton swab and stick it under there. Then put on some white lithium grease. There might be some other greases out there that do the same thing, just make sure you do some research. I'm gonna apply it to these three things, the gear on the right, this railing in the middle, and the side rail over here. 
I didn't want to get the cotton swab fuzz in there, so I tried cutting a Q-tip in half and using the end of that to apply the grease. After a while, I just spread it on with the tube itself. Move the lens mechanism up and down the rails as you do this so that you get it spread everywhere. Hopefully by now, something from this video has helped you. If not, I'll brief you on some other things to consider. There's a ribbon cable here attached to the laser, and part of that ribbon moves when the laser moves. And apparently this causes damage over a long period of time. So you can disassemble this a little bit further and replace that ribbon. There's a lot of them for sale out there and they are very cheap. Last but not least, the laser itself could be dying and it can be replaced. A small amount of soldering is needed in order to do that. I hope you found the things I showed you today useful. Have a great day everybody.